Hi, everyone, and welcome to Synergy's third Thursday webinar. I'm here with Dave Place, and he is going to present on ERISA, and I'm sorry, Dave, I don't have your um, title slide up. ERISA, you'll have to remind us. Sure, I'm, I'm going to talk about ERISA, um, FIBA, Medicare Advantage plans, and Medicare refunds. Thank you, Dave. And so if you guys have a question during the presentation, I just want to point your attention quickly to your control panel. And there is a section in your control control panel called questions. If you have a question, just type it into that box and send it to us. And we'll address those questions either at the end of the presentation or via email immediately after. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for attending our third Thursday webinar on ERISA, Medicare Advantage, FIBA plans, and Medicare refunds. Um, I'm excited you're here today. Um, I'm looking forward to tell you some tactics on how to eliminate or reduce um, these repayment obligations at the end of your personal injury action. Um, if any questions, please feel free to either email Susan, put them in the chat box. Uh, I want to make sure that you know, everybody gets their questions answered. A little background on who I am. Um, I'm the Vice President at Synergy Settlement Services. I run the Lean Resolution Division. Um, I've been doing it the past five years. Fifteen years before that, I was an ERISA recovery attorney. Um, the law firm I was at was Gibson & Sharps. It's now I believe, Gibson & Cold. Um, the company is now called Equion. It was then Trover, before that, Healthcare Recoveries. Um, we were a captive law firm in that we were an independent law firm, but all of our clients were just one, <laughs> now Equion. So all the plans that fed through that. I mean, it's a little different setup than Rawlings, where Rawlings and Associates, um, their one, their, their their attorneys are mixed in with their um, the recovery vendors. They're more of a business rather than a law firm. Um, after I spent 15 years doing that, I literally couldn't look in the mirror anymore, literally. So I had to find another way to practice law, uh, and I Googled and found Synergy as the only plaintiff's lien resolution company. Um, in the past five years, we've really um, taken that mantle on. Um, we are the only group out there that fights liens. Um, we have competitors who talk about being um, neutral lien resolution vendors. I don't know how you can be neutral. I know Rawlings is certainly not neutral. Um, so I'm going to give you some tactics today from the other side um, on how um, to, to push back on all these different lien types and save your client money. Um, the general theme is going to be fight on these. Um, think about how hard you work to recover the settlement dollars or, or those that award money um, at trial. You don't want to hand it over to a, a recovery vendor um, who's sending you one letter, making a couple phone calls, and expecting to get all their money back. Um, you simply don't want to do that. So here's some tactics on how to, how to attack that. First of all, you need to know your enemy. Um, this big, beautiful, Star Trek-looking building um, is Rawlings & Associates. It's a beautiful new building. They just built it a couple years ago. Here is their campus. It's a thousand acres in LaGrange, Kentucky, which is about 20 minutes northeast of Louisville. Um, beautiful area. All those parking spaces, thousands of them, um, are full every day with recovery examiners. Um, they added 200 more last year, so they now have 1,200. They added another quarter of a million square feet of office space. And in that office space is 75,000 square feet of subrogation training. Um, I put all this out here because typically, um, whether a small law firm or a big law firm, usually subrogation matters are pushed down to either an experienced paralegal or a young associate as something to, quote, be dealt with. Um, this is who they're, quote, dealing with. Um, this is not a small um, enterprise. George Rawlings last year personally paid for this, the building of the Civic Center in his county. Um, that's much money we're talking about. When I was in the Supreme Court um, last January, and Montanel was being argued, um, it was said in open court that a billion dollars a year is recovered by self-funded ERISA plans. That is just self-funded ERISA plans. It's a billion dollar a year business. And for a long while, the only company out there doing it was Rawlings, and for a while, Healthcare Recoveries, now Equion. Um, now you see others, Optum, um, formerly Nginx, formerly my client, um, was out there. Xerox, now Conduit, formerly my client, is out there. There's Socrates and Fiat. These are smaller groups, but all of them are, are cottage industries who are inserting themselves into the personal injury um, practice to, to make a wage um, on it. Um, it's been a good business model. Um, they don't do much work. They ride in your coattails, and it's all profit. Um, so addressing that um, is going to require some specific tactics and understanding of how they go about their business. Um, the, the general point being, 
They are Goliath, we are David, always. Nothing changes that dynamic. Um, you're, I'm not going to give you a case today or a statute that says, aha, I don't have to pay them back. It doesn't exist. Um, they, have, they are the insurance industry, and as you know, they run everything. Um, the law is all on their side. What we're going to talk about is um, the pain points for them and the pressure points and how to exert that um, kind of influence to get a, the best reduction possible for your client. Now, this, this here is a, a copy of the Rawlings-McCutcheon memo. Those of you who deal with Rawlings have probably seen this memo. It's a three-page memo they send out with all of their ERISA cases explaining the, the case of United States, um, excuse me, of McCutcheon versus U.S. Airways. In the McCutcheon case, um, it was a very bad decision by the Supreme Court in that the ERISA plan gets paid back all of their money even before attorney's fees if they have perfect language. And this memo from Rawlings isn't wrong about the law. It just only tells half the story. It gives everything the most positive light for the ERISA plan. We're going to talk about the other side of the story today. Okay. Starting off with some basics. Usually the first question I get is, Dave, I think I have an ERISA plan. It's actually pretty easy to determine if you have an ERISA plan or not. If your client receives their insurance through their employer, it's going to be an ERISA plan, with a few exceptions. One, if they work for the federal government, it's likely a FEBA plan. So if you're, those are your um, Social Security office, postal workers, U.S. Marshals, um, if they work for the state government, sheriffs, school teachers, um, county clerks, <clears throat> those are going to be ERISA plans, but because they're a state agency, um, they are not allowed to preempt state law, and state law applies. Um, same thing with church plans. This is church hospitals, church schools, and churches themselves. Now, unlike state plans, churches can opt into ERISA. Um, the only plan I've ever seen do that is Catholic Charities. Um, everybody else is, it typically stays outside ERISA and is governed by state law. Um, and obviously, ERISA doesn't deal with Medicare, Medicaid, or individually purchased policies. It only deals with group, employer-sponsored welfare benefit plans. Okay. But that's not really the question. The real question for you is, are we talking about a self-funded ERISA plan or a fully insured ERISA plan? Now, a self-funded ERISA plan is really just a gigantic savings account set up by the employer. The employer and the employees put money into the savings account. Claims are paid out of the savings account. And when subrogation reimbursement um, recoveries are made, that is refunded back into that savings account. The idea being, when ERISA was written back in the 70s, written by the unions, um, was that this this process of self-funded ERISA plans will allow benefits to stay available for employees and premiums to stay low. Well, 45 years later, that didn't happen. Everybody's premiums went up and everybody's benefits were cut. But that was the rather laudable goal of these self-funded plans. Now, a fully insured ERISA plan is just group insurance. Um, the company goes out and buys a group plan from State Farm or UHC or, or Aetna, and UHC and Aetna bear the risk of paying claims. And what you're paying to those plans is just a premium. Um, that's, that is quite different, and fully insured ERISA plans are governed by state law. Self-funded plans preempt state law and are governed by the terms of their contract. Now, one of the things I said, we're, we're, we're David versus Goliath, so you're not going to knock him down with one punch. But the first thing you want to do is start building your case. And the most important first step is 29 U.S.C. 1024-B4. It is nothing but a document request you're going to feel like you're playing small ball. Um, but what's important about this document request is, is two real keys. One is you need to see the master plan document. That's the document that controls everything, the master plan document. I say that because typically what you're going to get from the recovery vendors is the summary plan description, the SPD. Um, I'll explain the reasons for that. Um, but what the master plan document is a controlling document, and this, this document request will get that for you. Additionally, complying with document request is incredibly cumbersome. Um, it is every piece of paper related to the document. The plan administrator must provide it to you. The plan administrator is usually a vice president or an HR director or someone on the leadership team has been, has been stuck with the job of managing the, the, um, the insurance contracts. They're not going to be used to dealing with this kind of document request. It's cumbersome for them. Um, in fact, in 15 years, no one in my law firm or company ever complied with a document request like this. One, because they're always sent to the wrong place. This has to be sent to the plan administrator, not to wrongs or optimum. But also because attorneys just accept whatever we provided. We send an SPD or the 5500, which I think is a complete red herring. Attorneys accept that and, and pay and move on. 
Um, don't do that. Demand all the documentation you're entitled to get. One of the key ones to demand is the administrative services agreement. Now, what's important about this agreement is so, so, a couple of things. One is it contains the information, the authority of Rawlings. For example, it'll say Rawlings has authority reduced by 30%. Rawlings fee is 21% of the recoveries. That information is important when you're negotiating with the recovery vendor. Um, but what's also important is Rawlings does not want you to have that because they don't want Optum to see it. Optum doesn't want, doesn't want Socrates to see theirs, and Socrates doesn't want Equion to see theirs. So this is, these are agreements that the recovery vendors do not want you to disclose. But the plan administrator is required to disclose. So what typically happens is the plan administrator gets our document request, tells us, hey, we don't have the, the ASA agreements. Those are, those are possessed by Aetna, or who the TPA is, or the recovery vendor. Well, they will reach out to their recovery vendor and who will say, we're not giving that up. You can't have that. So you have a situation where a, a vendor is telling their own client, you can't have what you're asking for, and at the same time exposing that client to penalties for not providing it. Um, that's a great dynamic to set up. Remember, everything is on their side. We want to upset that apple cart, change their business model, so they have to deal with your one particular case as a one-off. Um, I had five cases was my caseload when I was an attorney on the other side. Adjusters have about 700. They are not litigating those cases. They are riding on your coattails. And it is, a, as I said, it's a really good business model to make a lot of money at it. So it's upsetting that is going to inure to your client's benefit. Um, as the slide says here, sending this document off, this request off to the plan administrator is the key. It's never going to go to the attorney for the plan administrator. It's never going to go to Rawlings. It's never going to go to Conduit or anybody like that. In fact, this last bullet point is a cut and paste from a letter from Optum saying, here are some documents, but remember, we're not the plan administrator. We don't have to give you anything. And that's key. They don't have to give you anything. The only limitation on them is fraud, which is a pretty low standard. So the documents you're getting are not required to be anywhere near accurate. And often they are out of date, um, completely unrelated. I got a Coca-Cola um, master plan document from 1999, and they tried to tell me that was the most current document. Now, you and I know they, they've certainly updated their document in the past two decades. So the reason they give you that, those limited documentation you get from the recovery vendor, is that is what the recovery vendor has on their server. And, they, and they've they been told by the heads of Rawling, heads of Equion, I was told this too, not to go to the plan administrator to get contract um, language unless absolutely required to do so. Keep pushing back on the attorney and give him as little as possible until he makes payment. They understand that every moment you work in a case after settlement, you're working pro bono. That we, we say that all the time. Um, so they, they are very much in the idea of dragging it out, making you work at it, and eventually knowing, practice has shown them for 25 years, that you'll eventually cave and pay them. Um, so fighting really is key on this, and holding the line, um, and demanding the documentation. As I said here, most of the plan managers are unsophisticated. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that they're busy running their business, not answering discovery request or document request. Um, so when you get the documents from them, thank them. Thank you for the 5500. Thanks for the SPD. But I need more. 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 Um, and they only have 30 days to provide it to you. And those of you who answer discovery you know how fast 30 days can go by. And if they don't give you everything within 30 days, they become subject to penalties of up to $110 per day. Now here's a smattering of cases from around the country where this penalty has been assessed. And some pretty significantly. Um, and most of the time, the court imposes the full per day penalty. Now, you will see cases of $3 a day, $15 a day, $20 a day, uh, depending on the court, because it's really a two-tiered process the court goes through when looking at penalties. The first step is compliance. This is universal across the circuit. Rawlings or Optum cannot tell you it's irrelevant to get the summary material modifications or it's irrelevant to get the ASA. It is a matter of compliance, period. They have to provide the documentation. Now, the second step of the penalties, with the court will assess broader topics. Um, but it's not things like black boardable damages, like it costs us this much to get these documents. They look at things like the frustration suffered by the plan member, the behavior of the plan administrator. The idea being that the plan administrator, <clears throat> excuse me, stands in a fiduciary role to the plan member, as well as the plan and should be proactively looking to provide information to clearly inform the plan member of the rights and responsibilities they owe to the plan. Now, they don't do that. They hide the ball as much as they possibly can. 
Um, so that's the reality we're dealing with. But the, the context is a fiduciary relationship. Um, so this document request is important. It's about, it's about ten thousand dollars for three months. So what I recommend doing is we send out this, this, 10, this 29 USC 1024B4 letter immediately as soon as you open a case to write to the plan administrator, get you the documentation you need, but also it starts that penalty clock. Um, so at the end of the day, when Rawlings says, "Hey, we have a hundred thousand dollar subrogation demand we want repaid." You say, well, listen, I think you have $30,000 in penalties have been assessed because you haven't complied with my document request. Let's start talking at $70,000. Um, because you really don't want these penalties. The only way you're going to get these penalties paid to you is either you sue the ERISA plan in federal court or you counterclaim your client has been sued. Neither is an option your client wants to hear at the end of their personal injury action. They have more litigation ahead of them. So these penalties really are leverage. Um, and it's, it's, it's important to understand that when you're negotiating with Optum or Equion, that recovery agent is just someone sitting in a cube, um, you know, doing, doing their work all day long, trying to get a deal. They get paid when the money comes in the door, too. So you're trying to co-opt them. So they go back to the plan administrator and says, we need to accept this deal because they've really hit us on this thing, that thing, and we owe these penalties. You're giving them some ammunition so they can make their argument for you to the plan administrator to get to the deal. Penalties are a real important part of that. Um, it also shows you know what you're doing and they take you seriously. Um, the last point on the penalties is it's not required, but we, we do it just because I get a sick sense of satisfaction from doing it, is every 30 days we send a new letter to the plan administrator calculating the penalties for them. Um, this ratchets up the pressure on them, and if they're having a, an argument with the recovery vendor, it really puts the heat on them. Um, Having received phone calls from plan administrators saying, why are we paying to deal with this if I'm getting these threatening letters, um, I understand um, the power of those, of those document requests. Because what would happen was, I had 550 files. I had my client calling mad at me on one of those. Well, that meant that attorney was going to get an awfully good deal because I had 549 more I could really hit the hammer on. But I wasn't going to take that kind of that punishment from my client when I could just make a deal. So that's generally what happened. Um, so that really does inure to your client's benefit is fighting the good fight. Now, I'm going to delve into really splitting some hairs on the McCutcheon case. Um, now, before I get into that, I'll, I'm not sure if you're all aware of the facts of McCutcheon. Mr. McCutcheon was an airline steward for U.S. Airways, um, hurt in a bad car accident. One person was killed. He had his pelvis crushed, which was never repaired, and his, the pain from it was never mitigated by medication. He has since passed away. Um, he engaged an attorney. He took a 40% attorney's fees. He was able to settle his case for $110,000. Only $10,000 was in BI, $100,000 was on UIM. After trial court, Third, Third Circuit, and Supreme Court, um, U.S. Airways wanted all their money back. Um, Mr. McCutcheon, after trial court, had given them two-thirds of their money, kept the rest himself, and thought they were done. U.S. Airways said, no, we want it all, and sued him in federal court. He defended on Mayhole, the idea he hadn't gotten all of his value of his claim so that U.S. Airways should get zero, and if U.S. Airways is entitled to anything, they should at least reduce it by common fund, the 40% he had to reduce his recovery by to pay the attorney. All the way up, um, he lost. The Supreme Court said with perfect language, the U.S. plan gets paid first, um, so much so that Mr. McCutcheon was out of pocket $867 after the Supreme Court. That's just a terrible result. But Justice Kagan goes on for a page and a half. But what an anathema it is to American jurisprudence that a non-party gets all their money and the party to the lawsuit gets nothing. Um, she says, with perfect language to overcome common fund, you can do that, but the language here they found was inadequate, and they remanded the case to the trial court. It's important because Kagan talks about the language saying the ERISA plan is paid out of the recovery. Her question was, what does out of the recovery mean? Does it mean the gross recovery? or the recovery available to the, to the plaintiff, which means after fees and cost. She said the language wasn't clear. Let's remand it. What gets even more interesting if you go into Scalia's dissent. Um, in Scalia's dissent, he points out that at a lower court level, all the parties had agreed that the language said there'd be recovery without a contribution for fees and expenses. No fees and costs should be reduced by the, or take it, re, re, the ERISA plan's claim should not be reduced by fees and costs. What's important is most of the plan language you're seeing says exactly that. 
exactly the language that was stipulated through McCutcheon and exactly the language the Supreme Court found inadequate to overcome common fund and remanded it to the trial court. That is something that is not in the, Rawling, the Rawlings memo. It is really splitting hairs, but that's what's required here in this situation. Because so what happened on remand was two things. One, they found the UIM was not an available asset for the ERISA plan, so $100,000 came off the table because the plan language did not reach to it. And secondly, they found the plan language did not abrogate common fund. So the ERISA plan's claim was reduced by common fund. Now, splitting that split here a little bit further, the court talks about taking fees and costs off the top of the settlement as a whole, similar to like Medicare does, where if you get a million dollar settlement, you take your $400,000 off the top, there's $600,000 left. If the ERISA liens $100,000, arguably, they get all of their money because there's enough available after applying common fund. That is not how Synergy views that, that rationale. <laughs> it may be a little self-serving, but we're, we're allowed to do that. Our position is that common fund applies to the lien, or, and lien is the wrong word, applies to the recovery right or the risk of plan itself. So in that situation I just described, we, we would argue the, the $100,000 ERISA lien from wrong should be reduced by 40%, not the other way around. Um, I point that out because when I was on the other side, we, our, our, our firm motto was literally, we take advantage of ignorance um, because attorneys simply don't know ERISA um, and they make them, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year on that. I, I joke now that Synergy's um, motto should be, we take advantage of laziness. Because the, the big problem with being the 800 pound gorilla, as these ERISA plans are, is they're lazy. They don't bother to, to pick the language apart like this. So they're a little unaware at this point about the way the language reads in this decision saying that the common fund is applied to the entire settlement. They're, we are still having great success in arguing that the common fund applies to each individual recovery right. Okay. FEBA subrogation, I'm just going to touch on this briefly because a, a big case came out um, that has really changed things substantially in FEBA subrogation. Again, this is FEBA is the Federal Employees Health Benefit Act. Um, one of the blogs I read a couple of years ago was actually titled, FEBA, what the hell is it? Um, because no one's ever heard of it. Um, it's actually the largest employer, um, largest employer sponsored insurance in the world, over 8 million members. Um, when you're watching the news, they're talking about Obamacare or Trump care or, or whatever they're talking about these days, and they mention the Senator's Health Plan. That's what they're talking about, is a FIBA plan. Um, the nice thing about FIBA plans, unlike ERISA plans, is that tracking that plan language is very easy. This link right here takes you to the website, the Office of Personal Management, and all FIBA plans are listed on that website. So you can instantly get them. The other nice thing about FIBA plans is they're often not drafted quite as draconianly as ERISA plans. If you read FIBA plans, typically they will have um, a provision there allowing for compromise. Um, occasionally, they will they will specifically exclude reaching to insurance paid for by the the plan member, specifically um, underinsured underinsured motorist coverage, and they often not often but occasionally allow for reduction for fees and costs expressly in the plan language. So I recommend reading that plan language every time you have a FIBA case um, to see if the language is helpful. It, it, it is it is likely to be more helpful than a risk of plan language. Now. I'm not going to. I'm going to spare you the history of FIBA, but essentially, in 2006, the Empire v. McVeigh case came out, and the Supreme Court said FIBA plan subrogation right does not create um, federal jurisdiction. It is. It is. So the the subrogation for FIBA plans needs to be brought in state court. That is the form. But they didn't. They didn't issue any opinion on how the law should be applied. So for about 10 years or eight years, we had no understanding of. Yes, you have the state court, but what does the state court do on these FIBA cases? Because the preemption in FIBA is not complete preemption like ERISA, FIBA only preempts state law to the extent it deals with coverage and benefits. And it was found that subrogation was not dealing with coverage and benefits. It arises from state, state law tort claims, so therefore no federal jurisdiction. The Neville's case in 2014 out of Missouri came out, um, and Missouri Supreme Court found that Missouri's anti-subrogation provision applies. Um, the case was going to go up to the Supreme Court. The Office of Personal Management went and changed the underlying regulation upon which the 2006 McVeigh decision rested. The Supreme Court then vacated um, the order, asked the Supreme Court to rule again. The Supreme Court stuck to their guns. God bless them. And they said, we don't care. 
and that subrogation still applies to FEMA plans, you know, no repayment to Coventry. This time, Supreme Court granted Coventry's petition, and oral arguments were heard this past March in a, in a recent opinion, which just, was just granted we'll talk about here. The question was pretty straightforward, whether FEBA preempts state laws, prevent carriers from seeking subrogation or reimbursement pursuant to the FEBA contracts. Supreme Court, and I think a completely um, self-satisfying, self-justifying um, opinion, found that because the federal government covers $126 million a year through FEBA plans, that necessarily impacts the cost to the Office of Personal Management on the FEBA program, which does affect coverage and benefits. Therefore, um, FEBA plans have an interest in using federal recovery rights, and the uniformity of the federal system um, argues in favor of preemption. So therefore, they found FEBA plans do preempt state law in the areas of subrogation reimbursement. Um, even though you can tell I am not pleased with this decision, I think it is very faulty. Um, it is what it is, and that's the, the law we have now. So FEMA plans do preempt state law. Their contract is enforceable as written. Um, that's not great news, obviously. Um, and unlike ERISA, we don't have a lot of um, federal common law developed yet to address the nuances of FEMA subrogation. The one argument we make is that the rationale in Neville's is under the idea that um, the, the FEMA plan is repaid proportionally. So, it, so I, we argue that if the client did not receive the full value of their case, then the FEMA plan shouldn't receive the full value of their claim because they're, they're then, if they, they do, they're then eating into parts of the settlement that are not related to the FEMA plan. Again, that's a complex argument that is currently based upon it Dave place. So um, it has that kind of strength. Um, but despite that, I, again, I still recommend fighting on FEMA plans. We're still averaging over 40% reduction despite Neville's. Um, but they have become much more difficult this year. MAO plans, Medicare Advantage organizations, sometimes called Medicare Part C, sometimes called Medicare um, Part D, that's the prescription, um, some called, called Medicare Advantage, Medicare Risk HMOs, a variety of names. But they are their Medicare replacement plan. If you have a Medicare Part C plan, you do not have a Medicare A and B plan um, or traditional Medicare. You have, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of the two. And what's important about this is, for a long time, Medicare Advantage plans could not use the Medicare Secondary Payer Act as their recovery vehicle and have contract language. All that changed about three years ago and really changed last year. Um, and now Medicare Advantage plans are essentially Medicare. Um, they have all the recovery rights. They have some really nasty recovery rights we'll talk about. And their repayment formula is the same. Um, here are the regulations here. Essentially, if the settlement is greater than the Medicare payments or Medicare Advantage payments, then Medicare and Medicare Advantage have to reduce by um, fees and a pro rata share of the cost. And there the formula is right there. Um, if the Medicare or Medicare Advantage payments are larger than the settlement, then you'll get your fees and cost. Medicare Advantage and Medicare will take the rest of the money. Um, that is how the regulations work. I point this out because Rawlings disagrees with this. Rawlings says they get all their money back 100% because their contract was approved by CMS and their contract asked for 100% repayment. They are wrong. There is no case law or statute that supports that. Even public policy doesn't support the idea that private industry gets more back than the Medicare trust. They are completely wrong. Um, but I can't imagine the millions of dollars they've made just in the past year making that argument. Um, if you hear that from Rawlings, and we hear it every day from Rawlings, um, do not buy it, push back on it. Okay, these are the regulations and statutes here that empower Medicare Advantage plans to act like Medicare. Um, as you can see, all the, they extend all the same rights. Um, the MSP says that, the regulations say that, and there are even memos from the CMS directors saying that Medicare Advantage plans should be treated like Medicare. That took, a, um, as you can see, 2011, it took some years for that really kind of get through to the courts, uh, and, and now the law has all turned against us, and the courts now agree with all of that, that Medicare Advantage plans have all the rights of Medicare. Importantly, is the Medicare private cause of action. This has become quite a hot topic um, the past couple years because Humana in particular has become very aggressive in making this a profit center for them. Essentially, if you don't repay Medicare or Medicare Advantage plan within 60 days of their demand for payment, they double the amount you owe them. 
And you personally are responsible for that, personally. Um, I, last year, I was, you guys may have heard the Paris Blank case in the Fourth Circuit. I was the expert witness in that case um, for the law firm. They're one of our premier clients. Um, Humana in that case went directly at the law firm, never even named the plaintiff. Um, they sued him for $191,000 times two. The firm was not especially happy about that, as you might imagine. Um, they had a letter, and I'll talk about both these cases together, Western Heritage out of the 11th and um, Paris Blank out of the 4th. Very similar. In both cases, the attorneys had letters from CMS saying, um, a final demand, saying zero, zero due Medicare. They thought they were done. Um, in Paris Blank case, they got funds, dispersed funds, and what happened was one of the settlement checks had, had come in with Humana's name on it. But the attorney never saw the check, as you know, the check was deposited and no endorsement was given. Um, Humana waited and then sued them. In the Western Heritage case, um, it was a slip and fall case down in Miami. Right at the end of the case, the, the Medicare Advantage plan showed up. The plaintiff said, oh, I'll take care of it. Didn't. Humana got tired of suing the plaintiff and sued the third-party carrier, Western Heritage. Western Heritage pre had previously put Humana's name on the settlement draft. The state court judge had told Western Heritage to take their name off the settlement draft and reissue a new one. They did. When they got sued, they put the $19,000 in trust and said, Humana, let's put the money in trust until litigation concludes that we have to pay you, we will. They did. When they went to the federal, the federal district court, fight the 11th Circuit, the 11th Circuit said, placing money in trust is not paying. The law says you must pay within 60 days. You didn't. The law also says damages shall be double. We, are, we have no authority to, to make damages less than that, so the damages are due at $38,000. That situation, Western Harris essentially paid three times. They paid to the plaintiff, and they paid double to Humana. Now, I, 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 what I can't help but think that in Humana's office somewhere, there's this 28, 29-year-old lawyer who's just smart as a whistle, right out of law school, found this Medicare secondary payer statute, and, said, and came up with this great idea for a profit center. And his managing partner said, let's run with it. Um, it's now a big deal to Humana. Um, this is, it is, this is, this, they're not wrong. This is how the law works. No one has done it. Medicare does not do this. If you don't pay Medicare within 60 days, they do not double the amount due. They add 10% interest, and after 400 days, they refer to the Department of Treasury, who then starts garnishing Social Security benefits. Um, they will, they will uh, erase the reduction from procurement cost, but they have, they have never seen them double the damages. They're entitled to also. They just don't do it. Um, but, West, but private industry does, particularly Humana. So you really want to be on, on the lookout for that. Um, as a best practice, because, because the problem with Medicare Advantage is you can't find it. I can't find it. You can't call me up and say, Dave, my client John Smith has a Medicare Advantage plan. Where is it? I don't know. There are hundreds of those. Um, you need to make sure you're grilling your client for their insurance cards. You need to make sure you're going over the provider's bills to see if you have payments from somebody else. You see an ARP or a UHC or a Humana on there. You know somebody's paying those bills. The big red flag is if you get a letter from CMS, the BCRC, the, the recovery contractor, saying they've paid zero dollars, and you know somebody's paying those bills, that should be a red flag to you to go back to your client, to go back to those bills. Um, I, I get that question all the time. Now that's a separate consideration than Dave. The the blue cost the the, the kitchen payment I'm getting from Medicare is eight thousand dollars. I'm expecting to be eighty thousand dollars. That may just very well be, be that BCRC is not doing their job very well, and you have no requirement to go out and look for Medicare Advantage plan. There's not one out there. But if it's zero, that really should be a red flag um, that you need to look for the Medicare Advantage plan and realize that Humana waits in the wings for you to miss it. They're not proactively going to help you find this or even make you aware they have a claim. They want you to miss the 60-day deadline so they can make twice the money on it. Um, I, I hate to kind of deliver that bad news and that kind of you know um, paranoia to your practice, um, but it is the reality what Humana is doing, and the best way to guard against it is to just be proactive. Um, okay, we're going to finish on a positive note. <laughs> uh, I'll take a little time to go through this. Um, Medicare refunds. Now, you're going to feel like I'm talking about selling you a sham wow. You're not going to want to believe me when I tell you all this. Um, I didn't want to believe it. Um, my previous um, life as a ERISA recovery attorney and FIBA recovery attorney, um, I dealt with Medicare Advantage plans regularly, but I did not deal directly with CMS. CMS handles their own recovery. Um, 
so dealing with this was something we had to, we developed uh, about five years ago. Um, this program has really come on strong. It's an incredibly successful program, and we're the only ones doing it. Um, and why is because it's a really complex system of regulations and statutes in order to take advantage of the administrative process I'm going to talk about. Um, Medicare doesn't, you know, ex you know, expound on this very much. Trial attorneys are unaware of it, and it's something that is done post final demand. So you've resolved your case. You've paid Medicare for final demand. You've taken your fees and costs. You've dispersed a balance to your client. If there was any. You're done. These are options that you can do yourself. You, we can do with you, or we, can, or we can do directly with your client without any involvement from the law firm, um, because this is you've already satisfied all your obligations to represent your client and satisfied Medicare. Um, but what, let, let's walk through them. This is a this is a bit of a marketing piece for sure, uh, but it contains some very um, good information. One, as I pointed out, I didn't do Medicare uh, until I started at Synergy, so I also didn't believe that Medicare would issue refund checks. I had I, I wouldn't believe that I saw it either. So you can see in this marketing piece, this is an actual check from BCRC. It's actually $50,000. Um, so we put that on our marketing piece so people would believe us. We frankly have competitors saying don't believe in Medicare refunds. They don't happen. Um, we've gotten almost $4 million back now from Medicare since we started this really in earnest 2013. The average refund is about $25,000. And this year, our success rate is over 85%. Um, I point all this out. Um, to really encourage you to look at this. Um, this is a really great option to get money back from your client in situations where you paid Medicare a final demand um, of more than you know three or five thousand dollars. Now the first option post file demand are appeals. Now these are appeals we can do for you, the first two level appeals, because they're paper appeals. They don't require an appearance. They're just paper appeals that we can file, and we often, we do file for our clients regularly. Redetermination, reconsideration. Redetermination is done by a, an independent group inside BCRC. Reconsideration is done by an independent group outside BCRC. In a lot of cases, Maximus Federal Services. Now, appeals are only useful for two things, and this is a very common mistake by trial attorneys because we're used to appeals being appeals. Or, but appeals are only useful if the final demand claim summary includes unrelated care or they misapply the reduction statute. They didn't do the math right on procurement costs. That's really what appeals were dealt with, deal with. Everything else has another avenue to discuss with Medicare on how to resolve it. Now, if you don't get a, the right answer you want at reconsideration, and you're, the next option is a third level appeal before an ALJ, I would say it's decision making time anyway, um, even though Synergy can't do it. Because according to CMS website, it takes 28 weeks to get on the docket and 28 months before you get a hearing. Now, it's important to remember we're dealing with elderly, injured people. They have to wait more than two years for, for a hearing on their appeal. Um, what I've seen happen is attorneys go down this route arguing on a hardship answer through an appeal and, frankly, wasted years on doing that rather than going the other route. So I encourage you to... to Explore, listen to my, um, the, the rest of my presentation on the other options. Um, however, the one concern about switching out of the appeal process into waiver compromise are the deadlines. You see, you have 60 days to file your ALJ appeal after reconsideration. And there's no way you can get a ruling on a waiver compromise in 60 days. So you're certainly going to miss that deadline if you try another route. Because Medicare does these processes consecutively, not concurrently. You deal with appeals first, then waivers, then compromises. Um, so, for instance, if you have a compromise out and then file an appeal, they stop work on your compromise and go back to work on the appeal. Um, however, in the regulations, there are a plethora of itemized and generic um, terms that are, and options that allow the ALJ to, to give you leave to come back into the appeal process. And all of them focus on the idea that are you waiting for something from the agency? Um, or, or things beyond your control. So I, I have not done this. I do believe if we're in constant communication with CMS through the waiver and compromise process, and, we're not, and you're not successful there, I think that's awfully good evidence to go back to the ALJ and ask for leave to file your third level appeal because you were trying to resolve this matter through other administrative processes and the idea of judicial economy. Um, I can't, obviously the ALJ can make a decision on that 
you know, that they have the authority to make decisions on that. But I think that's a pretty valid argument to make. Um, and I, th I do think waiting two years for a hearing um, is a bit ridiculous. And when there are other when there are other avenues to pursue, they can resolve this thing in a matter of weeks. Okay, let's talk about waivers and compromises themselves. There are two kinds of waivers and a compromise. Um, the waiver, first waiver we're talking about is, is the most significant waiver, the one we do most of our work under, the financial hardship waiver. It's under 1870C of Social Security Act. Um, what, what this is based upon is your client's total financial picture, not the size of the settlement, um, but their total financial well-being. For example, um, one of the cases we had last year was a home invasion case in Miami. Uh, it was during a seven-year-old girl's birthday party, of all things. The little girls got away. Sadly, their mother was murdered. Their grandmother, who lived with them as well, was shot 14 times but survived. Um, luckily, they had, they had great counsel who recovered um, over $2 million for the family. They were in Section 8 housing. The mother was on Medic I mean, the grandmother was on Medicaid and Medicare. Medicare paid about $250,000 out. Their final demand was $160,000. The client paid it. We got all of her money back in 30 days based on a financial hardship waiver. It's important to remember, she, had a, she netted over a million dollars, um, but she still was granted this hardship waiver for a variety of reasons. Medicare looks to the idea of, does repayment, quote, defeat the purpose of the chapter or be against equity and good conscience? I love that standard. Um, there are arguments to be made, like is it, last bullet point on this, on this slide was important in the case I'm talking about. The beneficiary was now responsible to raise two seven-year-old children. Um, that's an expensive enterprise, especially if you're in Section 8 housing and on Medicaid. Um, Medicare said, give her all her money back. She needs it. Um, that's important um, to realize. And the financial hardship waiver is something you can triage pretty quickly. I mean, Bill Gates is never going to get this waiver. It's just not going to happen. So if your client is upper middle class, financially sound, this is probably a waiver we really can't apply for. It doesn't make much sense. We don't want to sell your client's air. You don't want your clients thinking they're going to get a refund or not upon this, these grounds. Um, but we certainly you know, will try. The process for trying is your client writes a hardship letter. Uh, this is a letter you don't write, we don't write. We give our clients bullet point talking points like you see here, a sample letter of, to review. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Um, but it's a letter they write. In the case I was talking about the home invasion, she wrote five sentences on loose leaf paper and cursive. It was heartbreaking. She got her money back. I've seen them 10 pages long. Somebody wants to tell their story to Medicare. Uh, those who deal with Medicare realize they probably don't read anything ever. These letters they actually read. I think they're the only thing Medicare bothers to read. Um, in addition to the hardship letter, your client fills out um, a Social Security form called an SSA. I don't, I don't have a copy of it here. SSA 632 BK form. It's a terrible form. It is the worst form in government. <laughs> the first, the, the word Medicare appears nowhere on that form. The title of the form is a uh, change in Social Security repayment rate um, and repayment of overcharge. The first 12 questions deal with your client's fraud and obtain the Social Security overpayment. Again, terrible form. You're allowed to skip the first 12 questions. And the rest of the form is nothing but a monthly budget. It's actually pretty easy, pretty straightforward, and a decent budget because it looks to all kinds of things, entertainment expenses, clothing expenses. And the idea what you want Medicare to see as much engine status as you can of your client or at least the financial difficulties you're dealing with to try to create, illustrate the hardship that repaying Medicare would create. Now, Medicare will either grant that in full, a full waiver, a partial waiver, or no waiver at all. If the partial is not big enough or it's no waiver, we move on to a compromise. Now, I want to point out that waivers and compromises, there is no deadline. We have gone back and got money three years later, post-payment. There is no deadline. We can get back five years, ten years, um, and ask for the money back. That's really key. And I'll explain the process a lot of our firms are doing to, to, to look for that money now. Um, but a compromise is done by CMS. Waive, hardship waivers are done by BCRC, the contractor. The compromise is done by CMS and HHS attorneys. So you get a much better look than you do on the other, on the other processes. Um, and a compromise is more like you're used to writing. The whole thing goes in there. He's old, she's injured, they're taking care of kids, um, they don't have any money. Medicare, it's not worth your time. Medicare, um, it's not worth 
um, you might lose, take our reasonable offer. Typically, we offer 100 bucks at the end. Now, Medicare doesn't always jump at that. Surprisingly, they have. Um, but they typically the answer will be, Dave, we won't take your $100, but we'll take $20,000 instead of fifty. dollars Here's a $30,000 refund. That's how it works. And the refund will come back to you if you issue payment from your trust account. It will be made payable to your client, but the check will come back to you. Um, the last option we have on the Medicare refunds is called the Best Interest of the Program Waiver. Now, this, this is actually, I find this one kind of funny, because Medicare doesn't have any idea what we're talking about a lot of times. Um, they look, they, they all, I've had multiple arguments to regional directors about, oh, this is waiving the interest accrued on the unpaid file demand. No, that's not what the statute says. I think because the word interest appears in the statute, they think that's what it's dealing with. This is simply an enabling statute. It simply enables the secretary to waive any claim he or she thinks is appropriate. That's it. There's no more regulations, no more statutes. This is all there is to it. Um, you now know all there is to know about the waiver program on this one slide. Um, it is really the kind of get-out-of-jail program. Um, usually, we save this for the weird cases. Um, hopefully, you don't have any of those, but Medicare spawns weird circumstances where you have money sitting in your trust account for years trying to deal with Medicare situations. This is what that is for. If the waiver didn't work, the appeal didn't work, the compromise didn't work, this is, that, this is the, um, the last-ditch effort. Um, as I said, you know, one of the regional directors in, my, in um, Atlanta told me, Dave, why do you keep sending these in? I have a grant an 1862B waiver, but five times in 25 years. And I said, Betty, I said, well, five, you know, three of those five were ours, so we're going to keep sending them in. Um, but we do try to keep our powder dry and use them in weird circumstances um, only. Because, frankly, the adjusters at Medicare and CMS get confused by what we've been talking about. And it takes a regional director and HHS to get involved to, to really understand what we're asking for. Um, again, hopefully you don't have any of those kind of cases, um, but unfortunately, you may. Uh, this, last, this slide here is um, a bit of a commercial, but really this goes to the idea of staying the whole time. Fighting the good fight does pay off. If, you, if you're not hiring Synergy, if you're not hiring our competitor, um, fight yourself on these. Um, push back as much as possible. I mean, you see our, our ERISA, you know, we were averaging 42% reduction. Fee was actually gone up. We're at 43% we're at right now. Um, across all lien types, that is the general tone. You, the lien holders show up after you've done all your hard work and want a piece, of the, a piece of the action. Now, they may be entitled to it. In fact, likely they do have a strong recovery right. But there are a lot of realities on how they prosecute their business, um, and their motivations that you can use to reduce the amount of their demand. Um, it's a little bit like you switch sides, and you're now defense counsel, and you're you're the one holding the money. So you have a little bit more power than you do as as, as a plan attorney trying to get the money. Um, so make sure you're you're fighting every chance you get to push back on these guys. Now I, I say this every time, and I sincerely mean it. This is the most important slide. My email and my phone number. I spend half my day giving out free advice. Um, not every case makes sense to outsource the synergy to do our work for you. But if you have a question, um, please give me a call. Shoot me an email. So I switched sides. I said the game is because I couldn't look in the mirror anymore. Um, I like helping plaintiffs. I like um, helping you keep the money um, available to your injury victims and not giving back to the insurance industry. Um, quick comment. This question always has come up. Um, I didn't put it in the slides. I'm too much of a commercial. On our fees, how our fees work. Synergy's fees work on lien resolution. Um, on how successful we are. Our fee is 15% of the savings we obtain, your client. Um, so you can quantify how much we're helping. We also can take over where you leave off. You, you've worked a deal with Rawlings, you don't think it's very good. We'll take over where you leave off, and our fee is only on the improvement we make at that point. So if you have any questions, or, um, please go ahead and send them in now. Happy to answer them, or, or if you think about them later, again, shoot me an email. I'm happy to do it. I'm reading one of the questions now uh, about equitable apportionment down at a MAO plan. Um, the 42 CFR, section 42, 422.108. Um, the Medicare Advantage plans, um, how we deal with those in compromise, that's, that's actually a great question, is unlike Medicare, where you have to go through the process I explained at the end of Medicare refund, where it's jump to this hoop, this hoop, this hoop, this A, B, C, D. Medicare Advantage plans 
don't have all those administrative and bureaucratic loopholes. You can have your whole conversation about negotiation and compromising their claim before you make that payment. So you have your first argument about or discussion about the repayment formula reduced by fees and costs, and then your arguments about equity, your argument about the realities, your arguments about um, for what other topics matter to your particular case. And our argument to the Medicare Advantage plans are, if you're going to use Medicare Secondary Payer Act as your recovery vehicle and act like Medicare, you have to take all of it. And all of it includes these reviews for hardship waiver and compromise. That doesn't mean they have to grant them. But they, I believe they have to engage in the process of reviewing along with those guidelines about being as equity and good conscience, defeating the purpose of the chapter, et cetera. Um, and we've had pretty good success with that. Because Medicare Advantage plans are run by private industry, who's using recovery vendors like Optum and Rawlings, who are interested in making contingency fee on repayment. Um, so it's, again, it's understanding the motivations of all the parties. Again, because the law is going to be on their side. Um, any other questions? Well, if not, thank everyone for their, uh, your time. I appreciate you spending your lunch hour with us. Um, I look forward to um, next month, the next third Thursday, the next topic we have then. Um, Susan or I will be available um, with any emails or questions you have. Um, if, you, if you'd like a copy, for instance, I get a lot of questions for a copy of my 29 USC 1024B4 ERISA document request. More than happy to share that. Just shoot me an email and I'll send it over to you.